And this video will be about using neuroimaging, and specifically fMRI, to understand or uncover the neural mechanisms underlying visual motion perception. And my name is Boss Rokers. I'm an assistant professor at the psychology department, both at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Utrecht University in the Netherlands. So visual emotion perception is critical for survival and it also helps a lot in uh, playing sports, for example. So when um, a person in American football is throwing a ball at us, our objective is to catch the ball. And so what I'm interested in is what are the cues, what are the signals that you're using to um, detect the direction of motion? Um, so there's actually a number of signals that are involved. And we know that a number of them are being processed by the brain. Uh, some of them are simply size cues. So when an object is thrown towards you, it actually becomes larger on the retina. And so you can use that information to figure out how something's moving. Um, predators especially have additional binocular cues that are telling uh, the predator what the direction of an object is so that they can grab it or uh, actually eat it. Uh, and so let's take a look at what those are. And what we're going to do is try and see if we can uh, see how the brain or if the brain is using those cues to process visual motion information. So when an object such as the one that you see here is moving uh, through an environment um, and we're looking at that object, um, that object is going to produce patterns of stimulation on the back of the eye. And specifically, when an object is moving towards us, uh, in this case, it produces rightward motion on the back of the left eye. And what we'll see is that when the object moves in the same direction, so it moves towards us, it produces the opposite direction of motion, leftward motion, on the right eye. And so when an object is moving in three dimensions, uh, we can try and infer, we can back out what the object motion is by comparing these velocity signals on the back of the two eyes. All right, so to get us started, I will get us oriented in um, the physiology, the neural architecture that underlies motion perception. And uh, with my apologies to over 100 years of research, this will be a slide that summarizes all that research very briefly. Um, uh, so there's a, a cascade of processing that happens in the brain. Uh, this is the back of the, of the brain over here, uh, looking at primary visual cortex. Uh, and that casca cascade at, uh, from the point of cortex starts at the processing of what's called component motion signals in primary visual cortex, or area V1. Um, so area V1 contains neurons that are sensitive to particular orientations and to the direction of motion that's perpendicular to that orientation. So there will be cells in area V1 that are sensitive to this kind of stimulus, and there will be other cells in V1 that are sensitive to this kind of stimulus. And so through a lot of research, primarily electrophysiology, it's been discovered that this individual sensitivity to what are called component motions is integrated into a pattern motion signal. So that's a um, uh, say the motion signal of a texture. So whenever we are perceiving a motion direction of a pattern, um, that's a constituted signal based on these component motion signals that are processed in V1. Pattern motion signals and pattern motion sensitive cells uh, exist in an area called the MT plus or the middle temporal cortex. This is uh, an area in uh, the visual system that lies downstream from area from, from area V1 uh, and gets input from cells in that location. Um, it's called MT because it's in middle temporal cortex and it's called plus or complex because uh, there's a number of areas in that area that are pro uh, processing uh, this kind of motion information. Uh, so our question was, uh, when we started this research, is uh, can we see what happens subsequently to these pattern motion signals? Um, so whenever something is moving in three dimensions, um, we get a, a motion signal in one eye, and we get another motion signal in the other eye. 
um, they have to be combined in a similar way that component motion signals have to be combined into a pattern motion signal. And our question is, can we find a location in the brain at which that happens? And so in order to do that, um, we conducted a magnetic resonance imaging experiment or an MRI experiment uh, where we were able to show different images to the two eyes. Um, so this is one of our collaborators, Ted Zuba. He um, is simulating lying in a scanner. And what you see here is that um, through his right eye, he can see a, a screen which presents one image to his right eye and another image to his left eye. Now, the thing to realize about motion towards and away from us, for so specifically 3D motion, um, is that two things have to be the case for um, a, a signal to be processed as 3D motion. First of all, um, the signal has to be related in the two eyes. So when a dot exists in the two, when a dot moves in depth, it uh, projects two different images on the two eyes. Uh, and so we say that whenever we have a 3D stimulus, we have a dichoptically separated configuration in the two eyes. Now, specifically when it comes to motion, when an object is moving in the three-dimensional world, um, this produces opposite directions of motion in the two eyes. And specifically, it produces horizontally opposite motion. And that is because our eyes are horizontally offset. If our eyes are vertically offset, then we'd actually have vertically opposite motion. All right. uh, this is an example of uh, the kind of stimuli that we're using in the scanner to find areas that are selective to 3D motion. So the image on the left half of your screen is presented to the left eye. The image on the right half of the screen is presented to the right eye. Uh, to the observer in the scanner, this doesn't look like two images. It looks like a single image. And the dots in that image appear to be moving towards and away from the observer. Um, so now, again, there have to be two things to case for an, uh, a, a stimulus to look like it's moving in depth. One is it needs to be dichoptically separated, and the other one is that the motion has to be horizontally opposite. Um, so we can contrast that kind of situation, which is a dichoptic horizontal configuration, with, for example, a situation where um, the motion is horizontal, but it is monocular. That is, we take the two dots in one eye. Uh, from the two eyes, and we present them in the same eye. Now, the stimuli over here have the same kind of motion energy. They have the same kind of motion information. The only difference is the eye to which the information is being presented. And that difference is critical for the perception of 3D motion uh, because the stimulus over here produces a 3D motion percept, but the stimulus over here does not. Um, all the other properties of the stimuli are exactly the same. We can uh, compare it to two other conditions. So instead of having horizontally opposite motion in two eyes, we can produce or present vertically opposite motion in the two eyes. Um, again, the only thing we do here is we take this image and we rotate it by 90 degrees and produce this image. Um, this stimulus, even though it has very much the same properties as this stimulus, does not produce a 3D motion per set. And similarly, we can combine uh, these two manipulations, so we have monocular paired stimuli that are moving vertically opposite. That, again, does not produce any uh, 3D motion per se. Now, if an area is sensitive to 3D motion, and specifically sensitive to 3D motion above and beyond just uh, retinal motion sensitivity, uh, we would expect that area to give us a larger response or to respond more vigorously to a stimulus like this that produces 3D motion, and a stimulus like this that does not produce 3D motion. On the other hand, since neither one of these uh, stimuli produces a 3D motion percept, we would not necessarily expect a difference in that area between these two stimuli. Um, and so we then set out to find out which areas are responding to such configurations. And as the title here is giving away to some extent already, um, to our surprise, we found the selectivity in area MT plus, or the MT, the MT complex. So let's specifically look at the data. And what we're seeing here is the fMRI response, or the percent bold signal change, which is some index of the neural activity in that area as a function of type. And what we did here is we presented either horizontal dicoptic stimuli or horizontal monocular stimuli. 
And just to remind you, the horizontal dicoptic stimuli produced a 3D motion percept. The horizontal monocular ones did not. And what we see here is a modulation where the, the signal is modulating more in the 3D motion condition compared to the monocular control. Uh, one thing that I didn't tell you yet is that um, the way that we set up the configuration is uh, we moved the stimulus for 12 seconds, and then we had a stationary 12 seconds where the stimuli were not moving but were otherwise exactly the same. Um, and so what we're seeing here is this amplitude is larger. Uh, we also see an undershoot during the static condition, and that is simply because we are normalizing the signal um, so that it has zero mean. So whenever we see a larger amplitude here, we also have to see a larger amplitude here. Now, we then tried the other two conditions. So we had the motion being vertical, vertically opposite, uh, and presented at either dicoptic and monocular. And in those cases, we didn't see this differential response in area MT. And so that suggests that um, this response is really specific to 3D motion stimuli. Um, of course, uh, we then try to quantify this amplitude by uh, simply making an estimate of this amplitude, and we plot that in the next figure. Um, so what you see here is the estimated amplitude of the modulation. Uh, and we show that that's significantly different in the horizontal condition and not significantly different in the vertical condition. And that's really a hallmark um, of the kind of response you would want to see if an area was selective to 3D motion above and beyond selectivity to just motion or disparity information. Now, one thing you might say is that maybe this signal is simply inherited from early areas, so there's already a selectivity to 3D motion in area V1. Uh, and to verify that, we did the same analysis in these uh, areas that are earlier in the visual stream, and we show that, or we find that we do not get this effect, we do not get this pattern in any early area. And so that really puts area MT smack in the middle of uh, processing 3D motion information. So to conclude, uh, our results suggest that neurons in MT are sensitive to 3D motion above and beyond selectivity to static disparities and monocular motions. Um, it might explain why neurons in area MT show sensitivity or have been found in previous studies to show sensitivity to both velocity and disparity signals. Now this has been somewhat puzzling in the past because Velocity and disparity were not thought of as being very linked. Uh, they didn't really give you the same kind of information. But in the context of 3D motion, it actually made sense because 3D motion stimuli contain both cues. And so you can use both cues to get a 3D motion percept out. Um, so I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, Ted Zuba, who did a lot of the follow-up of this work. Uh, Larry Cormack and Alex Hawk, who were both uh, instrumental in actually getting this work executed. Um, the people in my current lab, um, if you have uh, questions or are further interested, uh, go to our website at vision.psych.wisc.edu. And I would finally like to thank some of the people who made this research possible. Thanks.